We're having a few technical difficulties at the moment. Um, Holly will be joining us shortly, but we have Barbara Gago here with us and i um, really excited to have her. She is the founder and CEO at Pando, um, an employee career progression platform designed to bring equity, transparency, and structure to employee development. Um, and so she's really been building and leading high-performing teams and distributed in hyper-growth companies throughout her career um, and was actually the former CMO here at Miro as well as the former VP of Marketing at Greenhouse and Culture Amp. So welcome, welcome, Barbara. Is there anything Thanks. else you'd like to tell the group about yourself? No, I think you covered it. <laughs> awesome. Well, as we continue to wait for Holly, we can just jump right in. Um, really the big question here is centered around how distributed works really changed the way we think about employees and their career development. So can you tell us a little bit about what's changed? Definitely. So, um, well, first I'm really excited to be here. I actually helped found this event a couple of years ago with the team when I was the CMO and I'm really excited to see how it's grown and evolved, uh, along with the company, of course. So that's very exciting. Um, the, Career progression in distributed work, I think, has become like a really interesting topic um, as the pandemic has really been sort of this, I guess, watershed or uh, inflection point moment where everybody has to kind of like rethink it. And I think just to set some like high level context, um, there's been several dynamics changing over the years, regardless of whether or not we had gone through the pandemic. The pandemic kind of forced everybody to see these things and they have already been changing. I would say a couple of them are, if you think about employees and their, uh, their careers, we, we went from people staying at their company for a really long time or maybe even their entire career. Uh, and now we see people changing companies a lot more frequently. And often that's because they are looking for career opportunities or growth opportunities. We used to have everybody in the same office and now we have people all over the world. Maybe it's distributed hub model, sort of like what um, Miro has done. has done. Maybe it's completely distributed across uh, the globe where everyone is remote. Um, but that has also led to a change of that we used to have a bit more homogenous cultures, language, backgrounds, context, all, all used to be very similar when people were in the same office in the same location. And now it's become very diverse, um, both from your maybe ethnicity or language or background, but also just the general context that you have about the world and the work that you're doing. We've seen this big shift from hierarchical to flat organizations, and that obviously affects how we think about career progression and your career in general. And so those career paths look really different. Like it used to be that we really were focused on being a manager and moving up. Uh, and now there's a lot of research actually that shows only 12% of employees want to be managers and the majority actually like to be a domain expert and that we just need to create more specific paths around that. And the last I'll say is that managers used to be a lot closer to their teams, especially when you were in uh, an office together, or maybe walking around seeing how people are doing. And now, of course, it can be that you've never even met somebody that you work with or that you've hired. So there's definitely been a lot of change. Um, and as I said, that the pandemic has been a big inflection point of that. And I think it's a great opportunity also for us to kind of reevaluate and rebuild and a place to stop and let Holly introduce herself since she has arrived. Hey, Holly, welcome. Hello, I am so sorry. It was not for lack of trying on my behalf. I uh, could not get in. So apologies, Barbara. <laughs> it's awesome to see you. Um, no worries. I, I was listening to your whole thing, so it was great. I, I, I <laughs> could hear you introduce yourself and talk about our technical difficulties. Uh, okay, so Holly Castro, I'm super excited to be here. Um, this is such a privilege to get to do this with Barbara. Um, I'm new to Miro. I've been with Miro for a whole 10 weeks, and uh, this is my fifth chief people officer role in both distributed and super high growth environments. So it's 
very exciting. Um, the way I would describe um, my experience so far at Miro is that it's like coming home. Um, mm -hmm. This feels like uh, the place I have always been meant to be. So I'm super excited to be here. Um, I'm delighted to have the privilege of hosting this session because if I think about what is top of mind for chief human resource officers and chief people officers around the world, it is in fact this topic um, and how to make, um, make sense of the world of hybrid and remote. So really excited about this. Um, so why don't we jump into the second question, which is, you know, what does equity mean? We talk a lot about equity, um, but what does that actually mean? And what does it mean for career development? And if you think about it um, from the distributed workplace perspective? Yes, I think it's a great place to start and kind of have a line context on. Um, I think, you know, with distributed teams, everybody coming from different contexts and different experience and the place they come from is fundamentally different. Um, I remember when I actually joined Miro, it was very early days and we were growing quickly and we already had, you know, Americans and Dutch and Russians kind of all working together and sorting out like, do we understand each other? Do we have the same context? And I remember Andre, the, the CEO uh, and co-founder, at one point I said, you know, being a good American, great minds think alike. And he was like, oh yeah, we have a saying like that too, which is fools follow each other. And I was like, wow, okay. So that's really interesting that the for me, that seems very different, but you think that's exactly the same. And that's like a really good sort of anecdote of how I think we think that people understand us. And obviously Miro is a great tool to help the, on a visual front so that we can actually see what we're trying to say. Um, but I think it, it was really like a, a moment for me of like, okay, yes, we really need to over communicate. We really need to understand if we understand each other. and. And that really today with the amount of distributed work, um, we really need to build systems and structure that are like transparent and inclusive. And I think that equity, like equity as in fairness, like how do we create systems that are fair are not necessarily about making sure everybody has the exact same thing. And I think from career development or benefits, it's really like contextually, are we creating equal opportunities, for example, for everybody to have the same career advancement, no matter what their context is. So if they have a family life, or if they have, they live in a different location from one of the hubs, their ethnicity, spoken languages, etc. All of these things can make it more hard and more uh, complex. And I think that it's our job to figure out how to build systems that enable everybody to get what they need in the way that works for them. And that's really about that's really how we sort of create equity, I think. Um, this is something that I feel really needs to be reevaluated. And that's where I'm grateful for the pandemic because I feel like it's forced everybody to sort of like take a step back and rethink. And, you know, in the US, during the politics, it's always about big structural change. And it's really hard to do. But I think for us now as businesses, it's a really unique opportunity because we've all kind of experienced this together. Um, but yeah, I think ultimately it's really how do you create relative fairness in both career opportunities, quality of life, work-life balance, et cetera, for, for folks. I love how you said that. It's not, equity is not about giving everyone the same thing. Um, I think if I were to add anything on, I, I actually love everything you just said, but um, one of the things that I, I am really focused on right now is, is this notion of mindset. And when you think about equity, um, you know, how a person thinks about the effort it is going to take to um, build their portfolio of success and what, and you know, whose responsibility is that? Is it the company's responsibility? Is it the employee's responsibility? I think there's this, this mindset shift that's also happening that um, I think is pretty important, you know, making a conscious effort to develop yourself and develop yourself professionally um, versus sort of waiting for somebody to do it. it for, yeah. Um, it's important. I think it's really interesting because 
I I would say, you know, it's also very cultural, like America is a, is a very individualist culture in that way where it's like, okay, make it happen, you can do it, like, do, you know, you, rags to riches, all of that, like, it actually is possible, and you can do it. And it is kind of built into the culture that we have. And it's very different from, you know, Asia or other places in the world, for example, where you know, it's fundamentally different. And that's where I think it's really interesting and unique, the opportunity that we have, but also the complexity around this thing that we're trying to solve, which is, yeah, how do you actually adapt what the company does to enable, you know, all of everybody to equally have the opportunity to be successful? I love that. <laughs> oh, so many things. Okay, so my next question for you is with remote and hybrid, how should companies be thinking about employee growth and development, professional development? How do you create equity in, in career advancement? Um, curious to hear your thoughts on that. So I've been thinking about this a lot. Obviously, I built a company around this, so it's what I spend most of my time thinking about. But I think that it's, for me, like one of the biggest first things that we need to do is think about how we measure performance or what we call performance and do that differently. Um, the like performance management is typically how we evaluate somebody and decide who gets advanced in some way. And that's kind of like then inherently tied to career advancement. And I think that what we do now as a first step is like, we really need to look at how we're measuring because if we're doing performance management as an annual review cycle, this is something that happens to employees. It's not necessarily a collaboration. It's not something they necessarily feel they have empow they're empowered around. It also generates data for us as companies that are that snapshot. So it's, you know, one time a year, maybe two times a year. Some companies even force managers to like stack rank people so they fit in this bell curve. Um, and I think, or even the nine box, it's like, okay, you're this one or that one or whatever. And people don't really know what those boxes are or how to use that anyway. And again, still it's a point in time. I think reviews as the modality for how people advance, which pretty much is the way they advance, unless you have your outlier, like super top performers who are just like, yes, I'm doing all the things and I'm going, we need to figure out how can we make things available so the vast majority of employees can do the best. It shouldn't be about how are we measuring who are our top performers. It should be about I enabling more employees to do better? Like, how do we make the most people perform the best, right? And so I think that um, the one thing that I find really interesting is that we're, we're sort of lacking this point, it, we're, we're lacking the overtime trajectory of somebody's growth. So we look at it at one point, we're sort of missing the context of, you know, what have they done over the last six months? Did they have a manager change? Did something happen at home? Like all of these things that could impact how they're performing at that exact moment. Um, so I think that's the first thing. Um, there's a lot of other drivers that are, I would say, impacting expectations that employees have about the way companies should be thinking about career advancement or performance management. So in my mind, we need to be moving from performance management to career progression. Like just as a paradigm shift, you mentioned mindsets earlier. I think this is like a mindset shift that I'm really excited about, like getting away from this review mentality. But employee expectations are changing in terms of what they expect from their employers. They all expect to grow. It's always top of the list in terms of why they leave, why they join, what makes them engage. Um, the diversity of teams, of course, is, is causing um, a, a shift in how we need to think about that. Legislation in the US, a bunch of different states now, you have to have comp bands. So if you have to have comp bands and you have to have levels, and if you have to have levels, you need to know what the levels mean. And if the levels mean something, then everybody's in one. And then, you know, it goes on and on. So I think it's really like rethinking the um, the way we measure performance and then 
looking at the systems and structures that we're creating really to kind of rethink what we think performance should be. And I, I think that gets into um, like career frameworks and, and competency-based rubrics, which I can talk more about. Yeah, I'm excited for you to talk about. So you mentioned a bunch of things that I think are really important. You talked about individual expectations, the expectation of the employer, the frequency of feedback, um, and and really rethinking, you know, sort of performance management systems. I think the other two things that I'm noticing is depending on what the makeup is of the leadership team will will indicate how quickly a company can move or how slowly they're going to move. So how they've kind Definitely. of how they've grown their talent, how they've grown their careers, um, is also a really interesting indicator. I loved some of the things you said, um, just in terms of you know how how companies really need to have a paradigm shift because I think it's very very real. The other thing I would say is you know as as you think about you know how many generations are in the workforce today versus how many generations were in the workforce even just a decade ago. You were maybe managing five generations, and today you might only be managing three. I mean, at Miro, I'm barely managing three generations in the workforce. Um, it's mostly just two. Um, so, you know, I think those are super interesting drivers. What, if you think about like tactical steps that one could go, you know, go to in, in terms of building career frameworks, rubrics for dis distributed team, how do, how do you get started? Like, what is your advice there? I think like everybody might have a different sort of frame of reference for what a career framework is. I think at the end of the day, the most important thing is that we actually need more structure around this. And that's it. like period, dot, 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 no, dot, 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 just period. We need structure and the way that we are, are like some companies have put together rubrics and then it's not really integrated into how they coach and develop talent they might use those competencies for example to hire people but then you come in and it's like we don't use that and now we're just going to evaluate you some other way so I think when I talk about career frameworks and think about career frameworks the first step I would say or the first dimension is like what your leveling framework is I think this is really important especially these days because we're we're able to create more mobility for employees by creating more levels and being more strategic about that and not just basing levels off of what compensation data is out there um, if you have more levels we can have more narrow compensation bands which then creates more equity because then you don't have the situation where you have you know a level four engineer who's been a level four engineer for three years and then you just level somebody up from a level three and they're like that person's way more junior why are we at the same level and probably they don't get paid the same anyway so why don't we just have more levels so levels is really the first piece in the first dimension and then the second piece is using specific competencies for roles so you might have a handful of competencies that are consistent across the company maybe they're values oriented maybe there's a core set of like we're remote, these are the skills that we want to make sure everybody has. And then you have specific competencies for your roles and you use these to anchor um, someone in their level as well as getting feedback and coaching around that. So it's like, it helps mitigate bias and subjectivity in how you're giving feedback and also how you're evaluating people because there's a clear definition of what this competency is at my level. Um, and that's available both to the individual as well as the manager. Um, I think that the, the other thing in terms of equity and scalability is creating levels that are more consistent across the organization. So you might not use every single level for every single role, but at least you have a clear standard structure so that everybody who's a level four has the relative impact scope responsibility even if they have different pay, even if they're in different roles. Um, I think another important thing to think about is not stacking IC path with managers. So don't like a lot of first passes are, okay, you're an IC till level three. And then it's like manager level four, five, six. And that's like, okay, so I can't, I only can become a manager and that's just setting yourself up for failure. It happens a lot in engineering. It happens a lot in sales where you have really top performers that you promote to management. And then it ends up being diminishing returns uh, in a big way. Um, 
So I think the last piece I'll say, because I know we're getting close to the end, is introducing career frameworks when you introduce like a feedback philosophy, because I think it makes a really great tool to, to bring that to the organization. So we've done levels, we've built rubrics. Now we're going to train managers and employees on how to give feedback to each other in the context of competencies that are relevant to each other's roles um, so that everybody can get better at giving feedback in a more meaningful way. And of course, creating equitable career progression is all about reducing bias, mitigating bias, reducing subjectivity. So the more structure, context, and thought you put into this upfront, obviously the better it ends up being and the less problems you'll have later. I love it. I love it. Okay. So um, I'm going to flip it over to Lauren. Do we have any questions? In yes, we do. Um, one from Norbert. Uh, he asked, when you consider ownership over career progression, would you say the need should primarily come from the ICs proactively or managers should nudge people towards it? And in parentheses, he wrote, given you have the career progression framework in place and accessible to all. I mean, I would say, especially in distributed teams, the more uh, on demand we can make tools, the more bottoms up career progression is, which doesn't necessarily mean manager and employee, but more so manager and employee deciding somebody's ready and then going up whatever approvals need, like if it bubbles up to HR or the function head. I think that everybody has a slightly different approach and this should be a tool for managers also to adapt. Like they're, they're gonna know who's gonna be the ones to just go, okay, now I know I can do this, 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 and I'm gonna work on those things. And then managers can basically nudge those who aren't. I remember when I was at Miro, I had two people in the same role. One of them was from the US and one of them was from Europe. And the one from the US was like constantly like, how do I get promoted? What do I do? Da, da, da. And the other one was like, didn't really know. And it wasn't in her background to like be like that either. So I think it's making it fair means that we have to identify those situations. And in that case, the manager should provide steps and paths and tools. And in the other case, they don't need to. It doesn't mean the other person is a better performer. It just means that they have a different approach to their career progression. Awesome. I know we are running tight on time, but you both have two more questions. Um, this one comes from Andrew. He said, I'm curious if there are any thoughts on in-person bias and how remote workers can show their ability to process just as well, if not more so. I think this is where tools come into play for remote because it is definitely a bias and companies need to be very actively managing that bias when they do have in office uh, situations and remote. Um, but I do think this is where tools can help mitigate if you have a platform that makes all of this available and everybody can see where everybody's at, then that's really a way to help mitigate that. Um, but it's something that companies will definitely actively have to check. Yeah, I mean, I would say on this particular one, having been a remote employee um, that was away from the center. So I think it's situational. You know, is your company set up in a way that is there's a center or everyone is distributed and, and understanding what the situational differences are? I was away from the center. I was away from headquarters and I was a remote leader. I worked really hard at making sure that I was visible. I took that accountability on myself. Um, versus, you know, sort of waiting for the system to do it for me. Um, but that was a personal decision. It wasn't like somebody told me I needed to do that. It, it, it served me very well. Um, uh, but I do think that that, that sort of in-person bias, a lot of leaders have, been, have, have grown up their whole careers working that way. And so there's a shift that is happening right now. Awesome. And then one last question, since we are at time, um, what are your favorite newsletters, books, podcasts? I love this one. Holly, you go first. Oh, man. Well, I I pretty much listen to everything Brene Brown puts out. I really like um, sort of her management philosophy and how she's thinking about leading in today's world. Um, that's one that comes to mind. Um I've been doing a lot of listening recently 
to um, various different TED Talks that are questioning sort of status quo. Um, I can post in the in the chat some of the names of them, but um, I think that there's a, a huge shift that's going on right now that we're going to be living with for the next decade or two. So um, those are the two that come to my mind. I was on this, so that's maybe a little bit of recency bias, but Lenny's podcast is a great like product specific podcast. Um, and I, I try to, um, get other types of things. So I'm not constantly thinking about work because it's really hard, but I, I mean, I do love it. Uh, but there's a podcast called cautionary tales, which is really cool. Um, he goes into like historic events. You like that one too? That is such a good so one. good. I love that one. So That's good. Great. And it, I mean, you can learn from it for work too, for sure, but it's like sure. historic, <laughs> historic yeah. contexts and yes. yeah, what, what we messed up and you know, the one little thing that screwed everything. So it's really, it's really a fun one. Yes. Well, if you're both up for it, would love for you to list out books, newsletters, podcasts, especially the ones you mentioned in the chat, because I know everyone would love to check them out. Um, but we are past time. So thank you both, Barbara and Holly, for your time. Despite our little technical difficulties, it was a really great session, and we appreciate the conversation. Thank Definitely. You. Thank you so much, Holly. See you. Bye. Bye.